fact, I would like to welcome Silke Helfrich. She is an independent author and activist, primary author of the German-speaking Commons blog, co-founder of the Commons Strategies Group, and uh, former head of the regional Heinrich Böll Foundation's office for Central America, Mexico, and Cuba. She engages with activists, academics, business people, and politicians, and travels throughout Europe to explain the strategic value of the Commons. She's also the editor of uh, The Wealth of the Commons Beyond Market and State. And I know that, she, Silke, you have been working on your statement to the very last second, haven't I, you? I always do, I always do. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm so, unbearable before a speech. Okay. I'll so be then better after. I, I just let you get on with it. <laughs> well, welcome. This is crowded. I remember when we presented the first book, I've edited it in German on the issue five years ago. We presented it right here. Two... Too loud? Okay. Um, there was Andreas Weber as a commentarist, and he said, I don't understand why it's not crowded. So five <laughs> years later, <laughs> it's a little bit more crowded, actually. We had to um, manage consensus, con 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 conscientiously access um, to that conference uh, and, and, and we felt and feel and it will be I guess a shared feeling after this conference that next time we try to gather an uncommon conference an uncommon conference on the commons we try to do it in a really open movement congress style um, my talk today as Armin already said uh, has been prepared uh, with, with my dear colleague and fellow commoner, David Bollier from Amherst, Massachusetts, and shared in ideation uh, as well with, with um, Michelle Bowens, who both will share um, after, after the talk this uh, space with me to engage into a discussion with you. And we thought that a good way to start was asking that question I'm quite sure you're very familiar with, right? That, that many people ask you, oh, the comments, how, how do you get to the comments? And then you start saying, you know, that's quite a tricky thing and it, it needs kind of a long answer. And the good news is that's not quite true because I can show you a shortcut. You just travel to Colchester in the United Kingdom, take train... 68 and go right to the comments. <laughs> well, if that shortcut doesn't work, you might rely on some of the um, products and initiatives, publications and books and projects that came out of a real eruption throughout the last five to ten years on the comments based on the very idea of the comments all over the world. And, um, and, and sometimes then people say, well, but that's not a new thing. That's quite old style. There was already reference to this idea. And we say, yes, that's true. But we have to try to grasp the very heart of the Commons idea and adapt it to our circumstances, our societies, and our times. So indeed, the Commons, like this example, it's the famous pieces du Canton du Valais in Switzerland, First half of the century, they were built by very brave Swiss mountain people. And they are part of a very sophisticated irrigation system in the Swiss mountains, which enabled people to bring the water directly from the glaciers to the villages and to the farms. And they are still working today. It's a quite famous illustration of how long-lasting commons institutions may be. Actually, the commons as institutions are older than any state uh, has been in the world so far. And uh, moving back to modern times, these are the Great Lake comes across border grassroots effort to establish the Great Lake lakes as a commons and legally protected by a region. This is an initiative catalyzed by a network of commons activists in the United States called On the Commons. You surely know some of the On the Commons are here and share this conference with us, and they do it in close partnership with indigenous peoples. 
it's still in its early stages. I mean, think only of the dimension of what we are talking about when we are talking about the Great Lakes region. And they aspire to build a diverse array of participation and advocacy to remake the policy governance for the endangered Great Lakes. This one is one of my favorite examples. I don't know if you're familiar with. If not, just go to, to YouTube and look for the tech talk uh, from one of his, its incubators. His name is Cesar Harada. And he came out of the MIT, and he was really very concerned with the oil spills uh, from BP in, in, um, um, in the Pacific Ocean, right? In the Gulf of Mexico. And then, and then he wondered, why is it that high tech, which is so costly, is so inefficient in cleaning our oceans from oil spill? And then he started a, in a trial and error way, building up an open source project, building up an international community, and designing, just look at this, I like this image, because it shows like they, they reshaped the boat. Boats had always the same form throughout human history, right? And now they... They, they, they actually, in their experimentation, it led them to reshape the boat so that it now looks like a spin. That is why now it is so flexible and it's much more efficient in cleaning our oceans from oil spills. It's an open source international community-based um, project that, that connects this high-tech world to the, to the actual ecological dramas we are facing. Back to South Africa. This is a meeting of um, the Kakula Hedis of the Bushbuck Ridge in South Africa. They are called <laughs> Bushbuck, it's so interesting. The first U is an U and the second U is an A. Oh, okay, forget about it. They are a collective of over 300 uh, healers from two provinces in South Africa. The, the meeting in this photo was held to discuss the pooling of their knowledge and resources. Last year, I had the opportunity to travel to Croatia, and I was aware of a, a really sprawling, vital urban commons movement where activists and people from the academia try to kind of reinvent and reshape urban space as a commons, especially in those conflict region, regions which are mapped out here in Croatia. Another interesting example is that different hackerspaces or technophile projects connect to the commons idea, like the Embassy of the Commons in Poland or the Hack for Good initiative from Spain, where they explicitly try to reconnect to ecological purposes as well. Or you may have a look at the manifesto of the Fab Lab movement. Obviously, not all Fab Lab spaces have this kind of political dimension, but at least in Germany, the, the Fab Lab São Pauli in Hamburg explicitly has. It is based on the very idea of the commons. Or the Move Commons, which is a tagging system for internet content and project that helps to identify and support commons-based projects. You'll find it uh, down here in the space of Commonopolis during the conference. LibreOffice, which I guess at least 90% of those who are in the room use on their computers and their institutions as well, or at least, or at least um, the... the the, the, the project they reshape and they took over because LibreOffice, Libre it's, it's an interesting effort throughout the last two years. The community successfully took back a software product that was bought by Oracle, by a company. And this former software product was OpenOffice. And it was taken over by, by Oracle and then controlled by trademarks and domain names and they were still working with open source office, but even so, it was very hard to really get it back under the control of community. And now uh, that's the difference between open office and libre office. Or the Masipak project in the Philippines and beyond the frontiers of Philippines, which is a kind of seed breeding on farm iteration process based really on the needs of the farmers 
on the query or on the very question what kind of seed is adapted to our conditions what kind of seed is adapted to our needs how can we control as farmers and users the seed breeding process which in our time seems to be is more and more concentrated in the hand of big companies and so the very interesting thing on, of this project is they 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 rename the varieties they breed together on farm and and the way they re rename it allows them to avoid the national law on seed control. So they don't need to deal with all this issue of, um, it's not patent, yeah, patenting uh, in order to get market access for seeds because it's not about market access. It's about creating and breeding together and developing together the best seeds for our needs. Our not a part of this eruption is the eruption of kind of educational uh, and learning projects on the commons. My colleague um, Brigitte Kratzwald and I, we, we convened last time, last year for the first time, the Commons Summer School in a, a small village in, in the south of Thuringia. And um, uh, similar efforts are going on. This, the, the next one is the logo from the School of Commoning in London. Or, as I already shared with you, I had the opportunity to be at the Korean Academy in Western Croatia, where people from, I guess, 16 countries from Eastern Europe were invited to, well, learn together collectively, share knowledge on the commons or the Free Technology Academia, which is an, a, a project that serves to the global community in a way, but I guess it's based in Spain, right? Walter Tevens is here, who is one of the main collaborators of that project. The Digital Commons, was, which has been one of the first conferences convened by a school for the commons in Barcelona. And all those initiatives are really, really young. It's really an eruption going on. Uh, uh, this kind of projects, uh, people usually connect to the commons, like um, the Guasa area in the highlands of Ethiopia, which is managed by the men's community as common property resource. It can be used for grazing, etc. So for the for the for the needs for food and shelter and livestock breeding of the community, it's it's more than 400 years old. Uh, as I said, some institutions of the commons tend to be really resilient because they are adaptive to changing circumstances. And this one already, Stefano Rodotà reminded us that we have to look at the processes going on in Italy, which is certainly the country in Europe where the commons discourse is, is, is really kind of penetrating the public debate uh, massively. Um, also in Germany, it's uh, at least I... I, on my radar, there are, are different discourses going on also in starting in political parties, but Italy is definitely the country where this dynamic is kind of most visible. And one of its examples is this is, uh, is Na Naples. The city of Naples, this is just a symbol for the conversion of a private company to manage the water supply for people, to a public common partnership to manage the water supply of the city. And, and I would say, as Tommaso Fattori, who's also here in the room, um, used to, to name it, this is a, big, a, a great example for that idea of the communification of public services. So even experimentation on that level of the communication of public services is going on. Or you might know Wikispeed, which is quite famous as well. A 100 mile per gallon car, actually it's a race car, using processes borrowed from the software world. It's, it's actually, it's very lean. It has been developed by 150 people based on the use of free um, um, communication and development tools in the internet. And, and it's sometimes hard to imagine that one can produce cars the same way as free software can produce, but one can. So this is one of the products that comes out of the whole open hardware um, community. 
and it's now challenging the way production of industrial style production of modern lifestyle artifacts have been conceived until today. We go again to the south, to the Potato Park in Peru, a legally recognized indigenous biocultural heritage area in which indigenous people are the designated stewards of a region known for its hundreds of varieties of potatoes. You may know that we have kind of 7,000 varieties of potatoes and in the world, and the only way to really steward for them is to continue growing them, cultivating them. So that's what these people do for us. Um, and this is a project in Leipzig where young people, young commoners, they, they have a core idea around this. And around this core idea, they named their project. The core idea is we don't want a slice of the cake. We want a whole bakery. So the project is called the whole bakery, die ganze Bäckerei. Commoners bake bread together and share it based on individual needs. And, and interestingly, also they say, we only use the equipment and the infrastructure. We can support ourselves. We won't use more infrastructure than we can commonly support ourselves. So that's an idea of non-debt dependency. And finally, again, back to Italy. Look at this wonderful old theater at the very heart of the capital of Italy, Rome, which is the Teatro Valle itself claimed as a commons. And just a month ago, a bit more than a month ago, they held a Constituente Veni Comuni, uh, a kind of symbolic, of course, constitutional assembly on the commons to think about how law and politics and the state could be reshaped based on the commons idea. And just look at, look at this picture. It's, it's really packed. And in front of there is Stefano Rolota, one of the leading, leading figures of that, of that debate. So Sisyphus starts his training in the Netherlands with a styrofoam rock. Whenever somebody asks you, how do we go to the commons, give them a styrofoam rock to start making. And this is what we want to start with uh, in the second, which is the conceptual part of this call. Exactly, I'm done with this. That is the question, what do all these projects have in common? What does all this mean? Are these projects and the ideas behind them truly related? Is there a shared something in these examples that really could be a basis for a larger movement? It is easy to say that there is a commons movement out there, but it's sometimes difficult to put it in short terms and really figure out what helps this larger movement together? What is the social glue, so to say, between a fab lab and the hackerspace and the embassy of commons in Poland and the Masipak project in the Philippines? So we believe there is something that all these projects share and that, I, that identifying, crystallizing it, will help us overcome the crisis of political vision. The political exhaustion and fearful short-term approaches that always keeps us in the either or box, either market or state, either public or private, either doctor or patient, either teacher or pupil, either nature or culture. So our challenge here at the conference, our challenge at the Commons Movement, and especially our challenge as Commons Strategies Group, of course, is to make sense of this enormous diversity and develop to a relation to develop the relationship among all these what we call Commons. Robustness and coherence within the Commons can fill an incredible void in our political and cultural imagination. As far as I can see, actually. There is no credible alternative vision 
nor within the more official political system, like think about the programs of political parties in your country, nor among political movements. There are obviously, and, and, and Maristella brought it to our attention, highly appreciated approaches to this. But there's always a struggle, for instance, at the World Social Forum, where I often participate, to give coherence to, the, to them. Many, many, many of these approaches are all defensive, or fragmented, or narrowly focused. And the very problem with this is not that they are or fragmented or defensive or narrowly focused. The pr very problem with that is that the world around us is strategically very well positioned. In other words, market fundamentalism is everywhere. It is the default norm for all conversations in economics, policy and politics. And this is just a symptom of fear and a symptom of lack of imagination. The idea, it's this symptom of the very idea that we need a kind of blueprint. The more liberals tend to blueprint market-based solutions and the more kind of left test think about of blueprints of kind of state-based redistributional solutions. So this atos and worldview actually has penetrated into the deepest and most remote corners of our lives and livelihoods. Enclosures, privatization, exploitation of natural resources, financialization, land grabbing, etc., etc., are everywhere. And for me, at least as a political person, the worst thing of it is that those enclosures get really legal support and legal push and legal framing. One of the examples uh, I'm, uh, I'm most, of, most, of, most familiar with because I've been living in Latin America for quite a while, and uh, well, as you can understand, NAFTA started there in 1994. Uh, so we had NAFTA, AFTA, SEFTA, SIFTA, GAFTA, na, uh, SAFTA, TAFTA. <laughs> well, that, that's the way they call it, and they call it economic integration. When, it's, when it is quite a bit off, neo-extractivism and disintegr social disintegration, taking space and freedom to the people to manage their own resources because they have to be exported without barriers to the other country. So, and the other problem is that the most sophisticated and dangerous dimension of, the, is, of, of all this is the market fundamentalization of our minds. So people tend to think first and foremost in terms of, of markets. Of, like, they even tend to think about themselves as, as what is my unique selling point? Right? What is my exchange value on the market? Do I have a business model for my project? Can I capitalize my skills and knowledge? Instead of asking, does something make sense to human well-being or to put it in the words of Andreas Weber again, does it enliven us? The only question that anyone seems to ask is, how can I make money out of it? And our, our language that way, we accepted those concepts of the market in our language, and that way our language became a straight jacket. And it is, as Stefano Rodotà pointed out in the last session, Language is performative. In other words, it makes reality and it shapes the way we think. So let's name it, as our friends in Latin America used to do, the colonialization of our minds and of our language within a marketized world. And yet, the good news is, because I decided, if there is a bad news, we have to think about it, put all our energy and looking at the opportunities in it, the bright side of it, looking at the solutions and how we can get them out of the mess. So the good news is that market fundament fundamentalism is just an idea. It's a mindset. That is, we can challenge it with other ideas and with another mindset. We can bypass, hack, or undermine the market state duopoly which is based on market fundamentalism mindset. And we can challenge it 
and that is our belief in our guest and commons strategies group with a coherent concept of the commons. And to do so, we also need to demarketize our vocabulary and to commonify our minds. So, the commons is both a core idea for a fairer and free world and, as we have seen in the first part of the presentation, a wide range of social practices that help us meet our needs. And before I start digging deeper into the, the issue you, you all want to hear about, you all want to hear about economics and the commons, because that's the way the conference is, is named, right? And there has to be a reason for it. But before I start digging deeper into that, well, let me explain four short conceptual points on the commons. First of all, the commons, this has been said again and again and again and again, and still repetition is the master of our minds. The commons is not a resource, but a process. For example, that sentence of water is a commons, well, I don't know how, much, how many times I've written that same sentence in my blog posts or articles. I don't do it anymore. Because the, the sentence water is a commons is actually a bit weird. Water can or must be converted into a commons. And that's the very challenge. Because actually we know that water perfectly can be converted into a commodity, like bottled water to be sold in the supermarket. So the very question for us is, it, is how can we convert water into a commons? And it all depends on the decisions we make and the actions we take. Being a commons is nothing intrinsic to a good. It is more about us and our relationships to the goods as we manage shared resources. So we suggest to slightly switch that kind of core definition to the commons to a sentence that already has been introduced in Barbara's talk at the opening of the conference, to always keep in mind that every commons is a social commons. We suggest as a focal point for commons identity and culture to focus on the process of commoning and not on the resource. There is no commons without commoning, as Peter Limbo, the US historian, brilliantly put out. Okay, no manifestations, everybody see. seems to agree with that. Wonderful. If there's no protest in the room, I assume that everybody agrees. <laughs> Second suggestion. I think that the common categorization of the commons needs an upgrade. This one is a little more tricky and more difficult to assume than, than the former, I, I believe. By commons categories, common categorization of the commons, we mean that idea of there's the natural commons or the material commons on one side and the cultural commons and digital commons on the other side. And in a way, I think this is a crutch because it is somehow easier to think about a commons as a thing instead of seeing its deeper reality as a social relationship and a social process. So from a political and strategic perspective, I know that this distinction is useful in some cases, for instance, if you want to define access rules, it is useful. But there's certainly agreement to that, that managing access or defining access rules to water is one thing and access rules to knowledge is another thing. Because water gets less when we share it and knowledge gets more when we share it. But at a deeper level, at a political, strategic level, at a conceptual level, it is very difficult to think about the natural commons on one hand and the cultural commons on the other hand. And the most important reason for that is, is, is quite simple, it's analytical. Every commons has a material basis. It always, always relies on the earth resources and on the, on the real work of people, the care we have to take for them. You'll never find a pure knowledge commons. All of them are based on a material layer. All of them need energy, and even geeks need food. And vice versa, 
the so-called natural commons are not separable from the knowledge that is needed to manage and steward them. Actually, I guess that the most traumatic side effect, and this certainly speaks to those of you who deal with biodiversity issues, the most traumatic side effect of the so-called enclosure of the commons is that people forget how to collectively manage a complex natural resource system. That is why this, for instance, this is the global seed vault in Svalbard and the permanent ice of Svalbard. It isn't enough to protect our cultural heritage the enormous variety of millions and millions of seeds. Because in there, our plant varieties are disconnected from the knowledge and the skills to actually cultivate them and to make use out of it. And this knowledge cannot adapt, it cannot further develop. So it's a vicious circle. People just unlearn, they forget the social practices which are at the very heart of the comments. So, Please remember, let's see if we agree on that. Every comments is a knowledge comments. Third idea. There are only four. And then we go to the issue that is really interesting for you, economics and the comments. Every comments needs protection. Or I also like to call it that idea of beyond openness. Because I think that the idea of access is usually overstated both by the traditional left and by the open access movement and by Jeremy Rifkin, of course. An access rule in a commons is a means to an end. It's a mean to make sure that there is fairness in the commons. That is why, as I said, we have limited access to natural resources and free access, open access, to non-rivalrous resources. It is just a rule to guarantee that we can all benefit from the logic of abundance of knowledge and ideas and code. But, and here's the point, openness does not guarantee that things will remain open, as we have seen in the Libra Office Oracle example or as we can see in Google Books. The problem is that we tend to look at the rules instead of the underlying principles. And we should really wonder if the commons should unconditionally be open to everyone, including the enclosures. So the same way we have to protect a source of fresh water, putting access and use limits for the commonwealths, we also have to protect the idea of free knowledge. And we need to invent institutions and protection mechanisms so that free knowledge will really be free and stay free also in the future and cannot re be reappropriated by enclosures or for market purposes. And both ideas, the beyond knowledge and um, uh, the each commons is a knowledge commons and the beyond openness idea, imply not to build a commons concept and framework on resource categories, which is actually a kind of economistic habit. It's a habit that is symptomatic for the ontology, for a worldview that objectifies everything. Our suggestion is, in very general terms, that we base the concept of the commons, the definition of the commons, and the short descriptions we always have to deliver to journalists, etc., on the principles of commoning. Every commons needs protection. Remember that. And the last point in this part of the talk is how can we stay, scale up? Do you know that question? How can we scale up? Sounds familiar to you? So, and, and then at a certain point, I always was nervous about that question. Sometimes I even get angry, even in a public conference. And then at a, at a given moment, I said, okay, isn't, I wondered if, if, isn't that scaling up idea itself an expression of hierarchical thinking? Isn't the challenge to go beyond scale 
and to go at the level of principles and patterns and to look for the patterns of the social processes of commoning all over the world. If there are common and shared patterns, if the way we relate to each other in a hacker space, um, five minutes? Hope you stand more. Okay. Um, but I want to hear about the principles of common space economy. Okay. Um, so it's, uh, we were talking about the scaling up thing, right? And if you want to scale up, um, exactly, make our minds up on what, what is behind that very question. If it's not hierarchical thinking, and if you should not switch to another more important question to look at the very principles of the way we relate to each other, and if there are common patterns between, say, a fab lab and the Masik Park project in the Philippines. Because we think that commons are not built from bottom up or from top down. They are peer to peer. They expand horizontally. Let me put this into an image. Commons are densely interconnected with each other. Almost and almost inevitably, a network leads to the emergence of new system features, of new characteristics of the system that emerges out of that connection. And out of the interplay of the individual components, new characteristics of the system will emerge that had have not been visible in the components before. So emergence is actually a key notion in complex social systems. And therefore, our thesis is that, to put it bluntly, the commons does not scale up, but rather slowly crystallizes like atoms in a crystal lattice of society. So imagine that newcomers, newcomers like those atoms, can come from all sides and add to the crystal and grow it towards all directions. This, this process of growing, you can see it here, it's, it's not top-down, it's expanding towards all directions. Without, and that's the interesting thing, leaving traces of new hierarchies or new points of centralization. That way, small changes, commons by commons, can have big effects on the whole system. There is no linear change because the commons, like crystals, grow towards all directions, like, and that's the subtitle of our, conferences, of our conference, from seed form to core paradigm. Thus, we invite you not to be obsessed with scaling and to focus instead on the integrity of what we have and how to help expand it. We know that the human species has developed through cooperation and that the problem is that many of our institutions, actually laws and infrastructures, undermine this very idea of cooperation and give a stimulus for competition, to compete each other. So those issues of how can we help expanding cooperation and the very logic and patterns at the heart of the commons are at the very heart of this conference. How can we come from the small initiatives I showed at the beginning, from those seed forms to the core paradigm, talking about the infrastructures, the way we work in the commons, the way we conceive management of natural resources and knowledge, and the way we understand meaning and spirituality in the commons. That makes the agenda of our program. I know that I'm officially finished, but I have to share a last part of my talk, which is another suggestion, which is an important one. Because you might be all familiar with um, this Harvard professor, Jochai Benkler, who has coined the term based on his research on how networks actually work of common space peer production. So in a little ambition, of us, we suggest to go beyond common space peer production. Also, the reason for that is very simple, because actually we think that each economy, whatever, socialist, capitalist, whatever economy, it's based on the commons, right? 
in a double sense. It uses shared resources and it relies on processes of commoning. So if we now consider the commons as something more than a resource, as we agreed upon before, if we think about them as productive and generative social systems, then a, con uh, a commons cannot solely be commons-based. It has to first and foremost produce social trust, reciprocity, and cooperation. And in terms of products, because if we say that the commons is a productive process, there is something very concrete coming out of it, like the bread in the whole bakery, or the free software instead of Microsoft or Apple. So the commons as the products themselves, the, the products coming out of this productive and generative social process of the commons should be commons themselves, first and foremost, and not commodities. So it is crucial that a project, initiative, or a society must produce first and foremost commons and not just commodities as a focal point of its economy. Because commons enable and encourage people to continue relating to each other in non-exclusive terms. <coughs> or in other words, we're talking about a relational economy and not just a transactional economy. And that is precisely the way we try to frame the conference to think about how can infrastructures, labor, work, and care, natural resources, etc., be reframed from a commons perspective or in relational terms? How can we actually contribute to what we would call a commons creating peer economy. And here are, and I'm, all, I'm about to finish, six short principles of that commons creating peer economy. First of all, I guess you know that guy. That's not new at all. And it has been shared not only by Marxists. So, yeah. I think I've been at least, what was her name again? Ha <laughs> ha. Yeah, he had not, he had, she had not quite a good time at home. Um, but he had a very good idea, uh, which is um, use value trumps exchange, exchange value. And this was confirmed by both of our keynote speakers this morning. The co focus on the commas is on how. Is it useful to our everyday lives versus how can we sell it for money? Next principle, I guess you also know that guy. This is Disney, and, and Disney has been quite active in the fairy tale common, which is nice because we all have, we all are, and we all should do and enjoy them. And then he made a bunch of products out of it. And the very question is what did he give back to the commons? So that is the answer. Until today, nothing at all. So one of the very principles that actually they sue, they sue people if they use the way Disney reshaped Snow White. So one of the principles um, Walt Disney did not really respect, to be polite with him, was is that he or she who takes from the commons has to contribute to the commons. But this contribution can be delinked both in time and quantity. Or in other words, instances of giving and taking are structurally delinked in a commons. We call this indirect reciprocity. Third principle, principle and there are, there are only six of them, self-organization and self-healing. So commoning arises from specific opportunities to create together or from specific collective concerns about how to resolve a problem. So the group or community or network can assign distributed responsibilities so that there is an oversight of the performance of these several roles, but there are the many structural interdependencies make it very difficult to create new power positions or dogmas. 
So that is at least, it, it is not a guarantee. But the way the interconnection, the structural interconnection within the next work, networks works makes it more difficult to get it, to get it centralized, to get it, um, people in a power position. Fourth idea, free knowledge and what we would call white technology. So adapted technology, people can actually use, share, analyze, reproduce, repair, etc. All those things we cannot do, not even with the motor block of our car, right? So share what you can, especially knowledge, information, and code is really key to the commons. And sharing of free knowledge, free information, and code does not mean free as in free beer. It means non-discriminatory access and having and defending and protecting the right to share so that everyone can freely contribute his knowledge and skills to the commons. Beating the bounds is one of the ways commoners used in the 17th century to protect their commons. It was a kind of community festival where people were walking around identifying together during the walk the last enclosures and just taking off, digging off the fences again. So that was a way of resistance, organized basically as a community festival. So what we, what we need today, as I said, each commons needs protection, is we would need to look for a modern day equivalence of the beating the bounds idea and tradition. And the last principle of a commons creating peer economy is iteration. That means basically that we start planning something based on the needs and problems a community or a group of users has. We design a system and a solution, implement it and so, ever, and, and, and so on and so forth and test it on the field, on the ground, on the farm, like the Mazipak people did with their seed breeding. So robust commons institutions are most likely to find protective solutions through trial and error, tolerance for mistakes, and ongoing reflection. And just, and just to share with you two very short examples that I can tell you that this is not utopia. This is done in the real world. The first example is the open source ecology. People from open source ecology are here with us. They designed a kind of global village construction set uh, where uh, I guess it's 50 machines we would use to reproduce our modern livelihoods are designed the same way the open sailing boat of Protea introduced to you is designed. Where every step is documented in the internet, is freely shared. Everybody can contribute to this design process. So a sawmill, a bakery machine, a tractor. And obviously, but you, you would need it if you would like to grow your own food, right? And, and, and not doing the same way we did it 2,000 years ago. So, and, and the interesting thing on that is also that um, it is how our dear friend Wolfgang Sachs uses to say money efficient. In other words, we would need much less money to produce this kind of commons instead of the other one, a product, a commodity to sell it on the market. And my second and last example is Sequesa Sola, and I'm extremely pleased to have three people from Sequesa Sola from Venezuela here, which is a 43 years old project Construyendo Juntos Relaciones de Confianza. But at the very heart of it is that idea that it's all about constructing trust, trustful relationships among people, which is a hard, communication-intensive, problem-intensive process. But it does work in the case of Secosesola, which is a big, big, big cooperative feeding 40,000 people, if I'm well informed, and doing it based on a completely different logic than the market logic. And thus, 
staying on the same market. So it is, it is very interesting, and I invite you to, to read what has been written on Sequoia Solar uh, lately here in Germany, because they are on a tour in Germany, and to benefit from the conference to know them. That is at the very heart of a commons creating peer economy, foster relationship and not transactions. Thank you.